Hey guys, number one Marmaduke fan here. Uh, these aren't exactly typical shoujo books, I think. Uh, Dream and Sun, I reviewed the first couple volumes, and it's just like a it's just like a fun little gag. It knows it's silly and kind of plays that up. Uh, one of the funny things is that Ichigo uh, Takano's other work, Orange, is a really subtle exploration of coping with death and how to live your life and i want to eat your pancreas is a completely different author but it's also a really subtle like exploration of death and how to live your life to the fullest so i don't know like one of the most interesting things about the japanese manga industry is uh you know, despite people kind of like wondering out loud, well, gee, is, were the 90s the best time for anime? Is the anime industry in a period of cultural de decline? I don't really care. I like I still think when you compare like what the like the Japanese in artistic industry to the Western artistic in industry, it's it's obvious to me that the West is in a period of like cu cultural artistic decline, whereas Japan is in this period of like explosive uh, ar artistic uh, possibility. And one of the things is when I say, oh, the West is in a period of cultural artistic de decline, that is a very pessimistic thing to say, but it actually doesn't have any effect on you as an individual and what you can you can do. Uh, I had a neat thought, which is uh, a, cu a culture that's in artistic ascendancy, that's rising as a culture. All it really means is that the creative people are all packed together more tightly. So, you know, it's like the Middle Ages, the Middle Ages, and then a D Leonardo da Vinci shows up and that's a an explosion. <sighs> but because he's surrounded by a lot of other cultural, culturally inventive people, that explosion quickly becomes boom, <laughs> and it spreads out a lot faster. And those expre explosions keep uh, spreading outward as those ideas you know, gain popularity, Norm normie people start appreciating the arts, artists get really, really rich. Uh, and it went after it reaches an ascendancy, the decline, the, the geniuses can still rise up and have a cultural brilliant moment. <laughs> but uh, there isn't necessarily like that network of creative people where it ripples outward, right? So as the West is declining, where, you know, like Hollywood used to make movies and export American cultural values, like Hollywood movie stars used to be worldwide movie stars, and we're having less and less of an influence in that direction. We're making more and more popcorn, dumb popcorn movies in Hollywood or the artistic films, nobody goes to to see them because they're uh, really boring. Whereas in Japan, they're like really artistically thoughtful people are also really popular. Like a, someone writes a subtle story about death and it's popular with J Japanese teenage readers. And then instantly there's a cartoon adaptation of it and they're sending it to American audiences, right? Japan is in a period where it respects its cult, its artists because it recognizes that its artists are sort of like honoring Japan throughout the the entire the entire world. Uh, Dreaming Sun, I just, Dream and Sun. I just want my maybe like last little comment on it is Ichigo Takano is a really talented artist. Like I love how she won't just have like a couple set of stock expressions. Like you'll know like when someone's embarrassed or when someone's smug or when someone's silly, like there's, there isn't just smile. There's just like six variations on smile. Uh, and all the, the panel compositions are neat, but actually it's actually kind of like a really neat example of a good artist being lazy, a little bit lazy and just saving some work. So it is 90% people and sometimes a couple little backgrounds, but it's like, like you can tell in orange, Ichigo Takano is saying, this is a special story. I'm going to pour a lot of love into making the entire world feel like a, a bit more rich, a bit more special. And in Dream and Sun, the, the purpose is different. The purpose is let's have a fun time. Let's tell some silly jokes about dumb teenagers being, being dumb, right? So it's not as necessary to have like every Sakura blossom, you know, a million, you don't need to draw a million Sakura blossoms dripping slowly down to the ground in a story that's just a fun little romantic story. I, it cracked me up. So uh, moving on to like the main event, uh, I want to eat your pancreas. Great title, great title it's stuck in my head i saw like a little ad for that i just thought i want to eat your pancreas that's ridiculous why is it called i want to eat your pancreas <laughs> your pancreas right right uh, th that's like in the uh, jojo's bizarre adventure uh school of coming up with a really good title for your work uh I don't want to get too deep into it, actually. I think I'm going to watch the anime because there are parts of it I think I don't quite understand yet. But I want to watch the anime and I might do like a real in-depth, like all the spoilers, you know, manga to anime uh, review of it.
So in brief, what I'll say is there are a few things about it that uh, I think are really special. Spoilers, obviously. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Uh, it's a manga about coping with death. So obviously when I talk about it, I'm going to have to talk about the death. So you ready? Go read it. If you don't want those deaths spoiled, on the very first page, you find out that the main girl character, Sakura, is going to die and that the boy uh, protagonist isn't even going to her funeral or wake. And we find out that they weren't friends at all. He's a huge introvert. He doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't have any friends at school. And through a coincidence, he meets her at the hospital and sort of like browses through her journal and instantly finds out that she's going to die, right? And so this coincidence uh, brings them together because she hasn't told any of her friends at school yet. So it's kind of nice for her to have someone who knows her secret and who she can uh, kind of like, you know, talk about her illness with without it being weird, right? Like she she seems to be she seems to be at peace with it. She seems to have accepted her fate and is just trying to live her life to the fullest. Yet it's still important for her to like be able to talk to so like her family kind of makes it weird because they're so they're they're so sad about it. They kind of want to make every moment count and every moment last. And she just wants a casual friendship, basically. Uh, as time progresses, we get a strong sense that she is really into him and she's dropping hints that she likes him. He's not picking up those hints because he's too much of a incel bookish nerd introvert. Uh, but actually it doesn't, uh, like the romance is only like a secondary part of it. I'd say like the primary plot of this is coping with death and two people with different perspectives, learning to understand one another. Uh, and one of those things is, is it just coincidence that they met or did their choices lead them to have this relationship? So, you know, like, Extrovert, introvert, girl perspective, boy perspective, uh, rely on others perspective, compare myself to others perspectives, be self-reliant perspective, focus on myself and my internal, my internal world uh, perspective. And Sakura is a bit more of a uh, free will, free, free will type. And the nameless boy is a little bit more of a fatalist. He sees himself as kind of floating through life. And what's really neat about it is it's not about one of them being right and the other one being wrong. It's about both of them learning from the other person, right? So she'll flirt with him and it'll fly over his head. And then she'll kind of like joke that, wow, you don't really get other people, do you? You should try to get other people. Well, why should I bother to get other? Oh yeah, by the way, he, the boy isn't named. Uh, every time people refer to him, they refer to him as like question mark kun or boy who knows my secret kun, which is a great, it's a great gag. And they do some really funny stuff with it about like how they get around never mentioning his name. And some of it is like comic specific, right? So it's a, it's a neat example of having a trope that you could pull this off in a novel, but it, it works especially well in a graphic novel where you can literally like scratch out their name with like graphics or something like that. Uh, he learns her perspective. She learns his perspective. Uh, anything else I want to add? It kind of, it kind of, I've already talked about kind of like the worldview division between do you choose things in life or do things just happen to you in life? Uh, their interaction. So there are little like romantic interactions, but it never, it, it never like, fr 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 uh, I guess I'll spoil this. It never, it, they never like ha have the sex. <laughs> Right, even though it may, may, it's implied that she might want to have sex before she dies, she also wants to have like a pure friendship. So it's like uh, there's this neat balance where she's just tugging him along, or does she want to have a pure friendship with him? You never quite pin her down. That's part of the thing is you never quite pin the other person down. Yet through being with them, you learn something about yourself and you learn something about the other person. And her death helps. Uh, question mark Kun get a different perspective on life and learn that he has to actually work at relationships. Relationships don't just happen to him. He makes cho he, he makes uh, choices in his life that allow him to have these relationships and they, they are of benefit to him and to the people he, befri he befriends. Uh, it's really thoughtful. It's really subtle. Uh, in terms of like artistic expressions, I like how, again, it, it, it's more than just like the two or three stock anime expressions. I can't find an example, but when she's smug and mischievous, it's not just a normal smile. It'll have like a little crookedness to it, right? Because asymmetry implies like some kind of emotional conflict, guilt. They, they actually talk about the expressions here, guilt, the, guilt the expression, 
intense expressions. So uh, very good at like the kind of like stock expressions, but also variations on the stock expressions to make it a little bit more interesting. Of course, the Sakura Blossoms, like Japan's favorite thing ever. They have some neat cultural commentary on how the Sakura, uh, how the, the cherry blossoms blossom and how that's like in your life, you make choices and you wait for the right moment to have your life come to fruition and that's not just something that happens to you that's something you do it's neat it's a neat it's a really neato book uh it'll make you think uh you'll i, th I think uh you'll be charmed by the subtle romantic points of it also uh i'll go ahead and talk about this there's like a moment where she's teasing him and he pins her down because he loses her temper and he's, he's not thinking about raping her or anything but it's sort of like uh, she, her, her fault is that she's a tease and she sort of like emotionally picks on people. And his fault is that he bottles everything up and he, he lets that, he lets that out physically, which is a really, uh, dark, like troubling truth about boy girl relations. And, uh, I think what's nice about this is that he does control himself. He doesn't do a anything wrong. And, uh, the two of them, I don't know, the two of them learn the other perspective from one another. Like, so she figures out I shouldn't be teasing him about things like that. Uh, he figures out that obviously it's not right to like let, let your emotions out that way and uh, apologizes to her. And they have a real friendship, right? Like uh, they, he doesn't do anything unforgivable and they they learn from they learn from these mistakes and they form a f faster friendship from understanding that they're people with flaws. They're not just people they hang around with. I get Aristotle, Aristotle. So Aristotle talks about uh, different kinds of friendships and a lot of friendships are just like, oh, we like doing the same thing with one another. And I think like the secondary friendship is, oh, well, we both want to build the building together, right? So we're doing something good. We're both good at building buildings. Let's build this building together. And that's a higher friendship than just like hanging around and playing and, and gambling or whatever. And for Aristotle, like the highest friendship is the friendship of like mutual moving towards virtue. Uh, one of us is virtuous. We're helping the other person move, move towards virtue. We're both virtuous to degree, a degree and perhaps your virtues complement my faults. And they actually talk about this explicitly they're opposites and that's one of the things that actually interests uh, each other about them is what opposite kinds of people they are so an aristotelian uh exploration of the highest type of friendship coming out of japan called i want to eat your pancreas get it you'll love it that's it my number one marmity fan love you guys catch you later